It's Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Sonic Society, episode 699. I'm Jack Ward, and along with my co-host, David Alt, we're hoping you're enjoying us on the Mutual Audio Network. Yes, good morning, everyone. And this week, we continue with part two of Edward Einhorn's partnership with Untitled Theatre Company number 61 to present their adaptation of Jack London's 1908 dystopian novel, The Iron Heel. And it all begins right here on the Sonic Society. You are listening to Untitled Theatre Company No. 61's adaptation of Jack London's The Iron Heel, a three-part audio drama recorded remotely. I am Edward Einhorn, the writer and director. Please continue listening after the episode as I talk with Academy Award-winning filmmaker Deborah Schaefer about her documentary The Wobblies, an account of the industrial workers of the world. If you enjoy our program, please contribute by texting Iron Heel with no spaces to 44321 and follow the link. Or visit our website, untitledtheater.com. You can also find information there about the script to the stage play version of this drama. This episode is part two, Rhetoric. My dear comrades, welcome again to the Reenactment Archive, an audio archive of historical reenactments of the moments that led to today's Brotherhood of Man. I am Antonia Meredith, an historian and propagandist, and I will be providing the historical background to the story throughout. We've reached part two of our story about the Iron Heel, as told in the diary of Avis Everhart. In the last episode, Avis met a young, dashing socialist by the name of Ernest Everhart, played by Jack London. I also wrote the adaptation. Yes, I I was about to mention. Anyway, we just came back from a break, and we're about ready to go. Um, where's Anna? Anna? The young woman who was going to play the prostitute. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. She asked me to tell you that she wasn't feeling well. Oh. Well, uh, this is one of the Warblies, by the way. They are providing the music. I realize I don't know your name. Oh, Alana. Alana, would you like to play the part? I'm more of a singer than an actor. I see. Well, I will stand in then, I suppose. Do you act? Not since I performed a play at my communal education center when I was just a girl, but we all have to pitch in a little sometimes, I suppose. Yeah, it's just a small part of the script. We can skip it. No, no, it will be fun. Anyway, let's get back to our story. And where were we? Uh, the Philomaths Club. Oh, yes. Ernest had just proposed to Avis, and they were about to visit the Philomaths Club so they could tell her father the news. Thanks to Bishop Morehouse, the club had a home in the local cathedral. Let me say a word about the Philomaths Club. In the early 20th century, it was common for men to belong to clubs. Some were created for a specific purpose, to join the like-minded. Some existed merely for the camaraderie. The Philomus Club was a mixture of the two. It was created to be a forum in which men discussed great ideas. Over time, like many such clubs, it became a bastion for the elite, a place barred to women and the working class so that the men who ruled could sustain their ruling status. This new purpose was never stated explicitly, but it became clear as the membership grew to include prominent members of the oligarchy, including Mr. Wixon of Sierra Mills. Yet a vestige of its original purpose remained. Ernest, how good of you to come! 
Thank you. Bishop Morehouse, isn't it? Yes, that's right. I am most pleased to see you. Are you? Of course. In fact, as you will see, my whole address this evening has been partly inspired by our discussion. Who is this man? His name is Ernest Everhart. We made his acquaintance recently, and since then, he and my daughter have become quite close. I must say, I'm surprised to see you both here. Everhart. I've heard that name before. Mr. Everhart, if I might introduce Mr. Wixon. We've met. I think so, too. But where? I was one of your workers at the mill. At my mill? Uh, Ernest, you never told me that you worked at the mill yourself. Well, you knew I was a working man. Yes, I worked at the mill. Until I was fired for insubordination. I see. You were one of those union organizers. I stood up for a man named Jackson, who had been injured through no fault of his own, and for that I lost my job. Yes, now I remember. You had a knack for turning a hard day's work into exploitation. You and your iron heel. Yes, I remember. Your iron heel? My metaphor for the machinery of the oligarchy that grinds down anything beneath it. Who let that man in here? I demand that he be removed. This is a church, Mr. Wixon. All who wish to enter must be welcomed. Besides which, he is my fiancé. Your fiancé? Oh, I'm sorry, Father. I I didn't mean to tell you like this. When when did this happen? Just now. Happened the moment we met, sir. We just put it into words today. (laughs) Do you truly expect your father to agree to this arrangement? He's not only a distinguished professor, but he's one of the shareholders in our mill as well. If my daughter came home to tell me she was marrying a laborer, or rather a former laborer now unemployed, I assure you I would not let her out of my sight again. Do you even have a penny to your name? I have more than money. I have my fellow socialists who sustain me. They give to me when I am in need, as I have given to them in the past. In other words, you're a beggar. Well, um, <clears throat> I have not known him long, Mr. Wixon, but he struck me as an honorable man who cares for my daughter quite honestly. That is all I would ask from him. He will drag your daughter with him through the muck. Gentlemen, please. We have gathered here to take part in an exploration of philosophy, knowledge, and humanity. I have a story I think is of great importance, and perhaps, when you hear it, this dispute may fade away. We cannot all be Jesus, Bishop. Of course not, Mr. Wixon. In fact, until recently, I had not realized how far I myself had strayed from his teachings. But now my eyes have opened. A few nights ago, I was in my bram, driving through the streets. I looked through the carriage windows and saw a woman peddling herself. At first I covered my eyes with my hands to shut out the awful sight, and then, in the darkness, the question came to me. What is to be done? What is to be done? And then the question came to me in another way. What would the master do? And a great light seemed to fill the place, and I saw my duty sun clear, as Saul saw his on the way to Damascus. Antonia, Sorry, the break in character. Did you say that you were playing the prostitute? Oh, 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 yes. Is this where she comes in? Would a woman like that be in the Filaments Club? It's a flashback. You saw the script, didn't you? I skimmed over that part, I'm afraid. I'm not so fond of flashbacks in drama. They always seem a bit lazy. We don't have to do it. No, no, let's continue. Would you like to get in the carriage with me? I would imagine she might say, Why not? I have never sold my sexual services to a bishop before. Considering my current state of poverty, my priority is monetary acquisition. I assure you, I see you as a sister, nothing more. But I can offer you some food and some money if you need it, or a place to stay if you need one. Where do you live? A woman such as this would typically live in a crowded tenement apartment if she had any permanent home at all. Often her whoremonger would take her rent out of her wages, 
creating a state of permanent indebtedness. Then by all means, you must stay with me. Hearing you speak of your circumstances, I realize my house must seem to you a mansion. No, a palace. I never knew what palaces were good for. I had thought they were to live in, but now I know. They are for you and your sisters, a safe haven made to show honor to those who have fallen by the wayside. I imagine that she might be afraid that she would be made to feel wicked for her occupation. I am not fit to tell you anything about morality. I have lived with shame and hypocrisy too long. But to those who believe in Jesus and his gospel, there can be no other relation between man and man than the relation of affection. Love alone is stronger than sin, stronger than death. It is my duty to help you in any way that I can. I did actually write some lines for the prostitute in the script. Yes, of course you did. Thank you. I suppose I became a little inspired. Perhaps I should do more acting. Such fun. Shall we continue with the bishop's speech then? Yes, why not? And I say to you all that you share this duty to do what I have done and am doing. Let each one of you who is prosperous take into his house some thief and treat him as his brother. Some unfortunate and treat her as his sister. And San Francisco will need no police force and no magistrates. The prisons will be turned into hospitals and the criminal will disappear with his crime. Do not harden your hearts. Do not close your ears to the voices that are crying in the land. The voices of pain and sorrow that you refuse to hear, but that someday will be heard. And so I say... I did not come here to be made to feel small. I assure you that was not my intention. First you allow this revolutionist to attend our meeting, then you preach at me in his language. I am amazed and disgusted. What you do not seem to realize is that we are on the edge of a war. A war between us and men like this revolutionist here. I hardly think that is the case. Then you're a blind fool. There are a million and a half revolutionists in the United States, and they are ready to try to take everything we hold dear. That is a fact. Go ahead. Ask this man here if that isn't true. You do not know him, but I do. He's one of the worst of them, one of their leaders. You are wrong. You underestimate us. The army is not a million and a half strong. It is 25 million strong. We are going to take your governments, your palaces, and all your purpled ease away from you. And in that day, you shall work for your bread, even as the peasant in the field, or, or the starved and runty clerk in your metropolises. Why do you think the manager's society did not make public the census figures of 1910? answer for you. They were afraid to admit how many millions of people in the United States today live in abject poverty, without food, without adequate shelter. The revolution is gathering. We want in our hands the reins of power and the destiny of mankind. Here are hands. They are strong hands. When you reach out your vaunted strong hands for our palaces and purple teas, we will show you what strength is in roar of shell and shrapnel and in wine of machine guns will our answer be couched. We will grind you revolutionaries down under our heel and we shall walk upon your faces. The world is ours. We are its lords and ours it shall remain. And as for the host of labor, it has been in the dirt since history began. And in the dirt it shall remain so long as I and mine and those that come after us have the power. There is the word, it is the king of words. Power, not God, not mammon, but power. Pour it over your tongue until it tingles with it. Power. I agree with you. I agree with all that you have said. Power will be the armor as it has always been the armor. It is a struggle of classes. Just as your class 
drag down the old feudal nobility, so it shall be dragged down by my class, the working class. If you will read your biology and your sociology as clearly as you do your history, you will see that this end I have described is inevitable. It does not matter whether it is in one year, ten, or a thousand. Your class shall be dragged down, and it shall be done by power. We of the labor hosts have conned that word over till our minds are all a tingle with it. Power is a kingly word. Uh, I'm sorry, Jack. I'm afraid I'm the one breaking character now, but this does feel a little extreme. It's great fun to play a character as wicked as... Wixen, of course, but was he so blatant in what he said? We will grind you under our heel and all that. According to Antonia's research, that's what they sounded like. Historically speaking, Wixen knew that his power as a minor oligarch was dependent on his oppression of the working class. But even if that was how he felt, would he have stated it like that? I've never met a man like that, so it's hard to say. It seems quite accurate to me, Jack. One of my favorite passages, in fact. Shall we continue? So ended the night with the philomaths. It was to be a foreshadowing of worse, much worse to come. Disaster approached on padded feet. Two days after that evening, it was reported that Bishop Morehouse had gone away on a vacation to recover from the effects of overwork. It was whispered that his work had led to a nervous collapse, or maybe insanity, though I had seen no signs of it. Then, my father received news from his university that set him into a fury. (laughs) I had a luncheon with the university president. I was sent for. And you were reprimanded for your association with me. How did you guess, Ernest? It is nothing to what will come. There was gossip about Avis being seen in public with so notorious a character as you, and he said it was not in keeping with university tone and dignity. Not that he personally objected, oh no, but that there was talk and that I would understand. I made it pretty awkward for him, and he could only go on repeating himself and telling me how much he honored me as a scientist. It wasn't an agreeable task for him. I could see he didn't like it. Dude's not a free agent. Mm. The leg bar is not always worn graciously. African slaves were so manacled. Also criminals. It was not until the coming of our modern socialist society that the leg bar passed out of use. He offered me a two years vacation on full pay in Europe for recreation and research. Of course, I couldn't accept it under the circumstances. Mm. There's more behind this than a mere university ideal. Somebody's put pressure on him. Do you think so? Man, you heard Wixen just the other day. There's a shadow of something colossal and menacing that even now is beginning to fall across the land. Call it the shadow of an oligarchy, if you will. But what I wanted to say is this. You are in a perilous position, a peril that my own fear enhances because I am not even able to measure it. Take my advice and accept the vacation. (laughs) They can't hurt me. I am independent. I have not been a professor for the sake of my salary. I can get along very comfortably on my own income, and the salary is all they can take from me. If all that I fear be so, your private income, your principal itself can be taken away from you just as easily as your salary. It would be cowardly. I urge you. You do not know them as I do. They will do everything they can to destroy you. You have sung me your songs. I have read your propaganda. So now you see you have persuaded me. Let them take what they might. Afterwards... I asked Ernest why he advised my father to quit if he himself was such an unwavering supporter of the revolution. Because I love you. And, like Ruth of old, thy people are my people. From that moment on, events began to fall about us thick and fast. 
capitalism collapsed from its own weight in the years of prosperity needed to be paid for. Suddenly, all markets were glutted. All markets were falling, and amidst the general crumble of prices, the price of labor crumbled fastest of all. Strike! 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 Labor was striking here, there, and everywhere. And where it was not striking, it was being turned out by the capitalists. The papers were filled with tales of violence and blood. And through it all, the Black Hundreds played their part. The Black Hundreds were the secret agents of the oligarchy, who disguised themselves as workers and used violence in order to destroy the reputation of the working class. They are memorialized in this song. Never had labor received such an all-around beating. The great captains of industry, the oligarchs, had for the first time thrown their full weight into the breach. Labor was bloody and sullen, crushed. Yet its defeat did not put an end to the hard times. The banks themselves, constituting one of the most important forces of the oligarchy, continued to call in credits. The Wall Street Group turned the stock market into a maelstrom where the values of all the stock crumpled away almost to nothingness. Wall Street was a street in ancient New York where the irrational organization of society permitted underhanded manipulation of all the wealth in the country. As the stocks plummeted, the fortunes of the middle class plummeted as well. The oligarchs alone knew how to reap the whirlwind and make a profit off of it. And such profits, colossal profits, they swiftly plundered the wrecks that floated about them as if they had anticipated the storm all along. Even Ernest was astounded at the quickness. It's no use. We're beaten. The Iron Heel is triumphant. Wixen was right. We shall be robbed of our few remaining liberties. The Iron Heel will walk upon our faces. Nothing remains but a bloody revolution of the working class. But of course we will win, but I shudder to think of it. Ernest took me to a meeting with his fellow socialists in a basement underneath the mill. His comrades insisted that victory could be gained through the elections. You must run for Congress, Ernest. The majority is with us. If enough people sympathetic with our cause run for Congress, we can turn the tide. And when they take me out of Congress and put me against a wall and blow my brains out, what then? Then we we rise rise in in might. might. Then you'll welter in your gore. I've heard that same song sung by the middle class. Where now is their might? It is either you or Wixen. Wixen? 
Didn't you hear? He announced his candidacy just yesterday. Of course. It is their way of operation. Control the government and thereby control the worker. But Wixen, he is the worst. The, the very worst of them. Yeah, very well. I fear it is a helpless cause, but I will run. What will that mean for you, Ernest? What will that mean for us? Well, it means we must marry immediately before the tide of events pulls us apart. I still insisted that I wanted Bishop Morehouse to perform the ceremony, and no other. Ernest seemed quietly doubtful, but did not try to stop me from visiting the bishop. I have put my home on the market. But it is so beautiful. And what of the woman you were housing there? Yes, it is true, but there are so many. I could do so much more, much more than what I am doing. The house, the paintings, the library. I could be using that money to feed someone. You must not ruin yourself. The potatoes, they are precious. Is that a bag of them, I see? There is an old woman. I must take it to her at once. She is suffering from the want of it. I must go at once. You understand? Then I will return. I promise you. But, Bishop, I have come to talk to you about my marriage. An old German woman. Sixty-four. Her hands are misshapen from rheumatism, but all she does is sew from morning till night. Six cents per pair of trousers. Each trouser takes two hours. Her only daughter died when a boiler exploded in the factory. No one to take care of her but me. I will go with you. It is your Ernest who is responsible for this change in me. It is too much for you to bear. I am grateful. I have him to thank for showing me my path. And I am very happy. Only, only the persecution. I harm no one. Why will they not let me alone? But it is not that. It is the nature of the persecution. I shouldn't mind if they cut my flesh with stripes, or burned me at the stake, or crucified me head downward. But it is the asylum that frightens me. Think of it, of me in an asylum for the insane. It is revolting. I saw some of the cases at the sanitarium. They were violent. My blood chills when I think of it. And to be in prison for the rest of my life amid scenes of screaming madness? No, no, not that, not that! I I will not let them. Ernest will not let them. Forgive me. It is my wretched nerves. And if the master's work leads there, so be it. Who am I to complain? Soon my house will be sold, all my other possessions... I must do it secretly, else they will take everything away from me. I often marvel these days at the immense quantity of potatoes two or three hundred thousand dollars will buy. Or bread, or meat, or coal and kindling. Ernest is entering politics. I know things have gotten bad, but he is working to change it for the better. And we are to be married soon. That is what I have come to tell you. You must officiate our wedding. You will need to find someone else. I cannot be seen in public. Not now. They will put me in a madhouse. But tell your young man that I have at last found my work in the world. It is the master's work. You caught me feeding his lambs. And of course, you will both keep my secret. I ran to Ernest to beg him to talk the bishop out of his plans to impoverish himself, but... Ernest refused. He was in the basement under the mill again, waiting for another meeting of the socialists. No matter how small the good, nevertheless, his little inadequate wail will be productive of some good in the revolution, and every little bit counts. Perhaps the church can protect him. Christ told the rich young man to sell all he had. The bishop has decided to obey Christ's injunction, and... It will get him locked up in a madhouse. Times have changed since Christ's day. A rich man today who gives all he has to the poor is crazy. There's no discussion. Society has spoken. But the church... He has left the church already. The church feeds at the same trough as the oligarchy, and together they will be his ruin. Then why will you not try to dissuade him? 
when you just advised my father to take the easier path and quit the university the other day. I cannot protect the world from the ravages of the revolution. I have chosen you, and I have chosen your father, and I am selfish. Yes, I am selfish. I know what is to come, and I have chosen to protect my family, but I cannot protect the world. Is that why, or is it because you despise the church? I have told you your bishop has left the church. Where's the pity for him? Isn't his downfall the very reason he is persecuted? Because he listened to you and your socialist ideas. If he had truly listened to me, he would be taking up arms. The revolution cannot be won by good deeds alone. He's not a violent man. Neither am I. But I understand the necessity. Perhaps if the revolution had leaders like the bishop, violence wouldn't be necessary. The bishop is not a leader. Then a man like him. Such men are fantasies, I'm afraid. I understand why you would long for them, but they're fantasies. A week later, we were married by a man I'd never seen before in my life and would never see after. Only my father attended. I have a donation for your new life towards the cause. I've sold the house. Most of my money disappeared along with the stocks, just like everyone else. No matter, I am happy for you and for myself. For I have my freedom. My beliefs are my own. No man can change that. A few days after that, I read that the bishop had been committed to the Napa Asylum. In vain, we tried to see him. Later, we learned that he had been transferred to Stockton, to Agnews, and then all the way off to Chicago. After that, we heard no more. In the meantime, events conspired in the socialist's favor for once. Hearst has gone bankrupt. William Randolph Hearst was a young California millionaire who became the most powerful newspaper owner in the country. His newspapers were published in all the large cities and they appealed to the perishing middle class and to the proletariat. So large was his following that he managed to take possession of the empty shell of the old Democratic Party. He occupied an anomalous position preaching an emasculated socialism combined with a nondescript sort of petty bourgeois capitalism. It was oil and water and there was no hope for him, though for a short period he was a source of serious apprehension to the plutocrats. Bankrupt? How? By fiat of the plutocrats, they have colluded to stop advertising in his papers and have driven him out of business. The Democrats do not know how to run a party without the crutch of his millions. The perfect opening. We know how to run a campaign without depending on Hearst. And what better time than now when the workers are crying for an authentic voice, your voice, our voice. It is the end of capitalism. It is the end of the Democratic Party, perhaps, but the machine of capitalism will not be broken so easily. We must spread our propaganda. The time for newspapers is over. It will take an army of us mouth to mouth. We have an army. And we must organize a public debate. Wixen will never agree to it. Well, we must give him no choice. We must make the people demand it. Do you think it's possible? If we are to have any chance of winning, we must be heard. It is time to call for a general strike. We will refuse to work in their factories until they agree to include us in the next public debate. We have the people and the will now more than ever. Now that the workers have seen the bloodthirsty power of the oligarchs, spread the word. No work until the Socialist Workers' Party is allowed a voice. We will prevail. I can feel it. I wish I could believe it, but I think blood, much more blood, will be shed before we can crawl out from under the iron heel. It happened much as Ernest projected. At first, the Socialists demanded to be included in the next debate, and the Democrats and Republicans resisted. A general strike was threatened, but support for it was uncertain. It seemed for a while that perhaps the oligarchy would prevail. Then, the Honolulu affair changed everything. In 1912, after years of tension about the world market, a German fleet attacked Honolulu, sinking three ships and bombarding the city. The next day, war was declared between America and Germany. Within an hour, the call for a general strike was finally heeded, not only by the American socialists, but by the German socialists as well. Without the support of the workers, 
the machinery of war quickly ground to a halt. The women proved to be the strongest promoters of the strike. They set their faces against the war. They did not want their men to go forth and die. Then, also, the idea of the general strike caught the mood of the people. It struck their sense of humor. The idea was infectious. The children struck in all the schools, and such teachers as came went home again from deserted classrooms. The general strike took the form of a great national picnic. For a week, it was as if the world of the oligarchy had ceased to exist. And for once, Ernest was optimistic. Perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps we won't need bloodshed after all. They've agreed to our terms. They will allow you to participate in the next debate. And not only you, the Socialist Workers' Party candidates have been invited to take part in debates across the country. One last-ditch effort to confront us and turn the world back towards war, no doubt. (laughs) They underestimate you. No, they underestimate the workers. They will not be swayed by rhetoric and fear-mongering. So, I will be debating Wixon directly? The Democrat will be there too, of course, uh, James Roberts weak man and a weaker candidate. He may call himself a Democrat, but he has spent his life as part of the oligarchy. Be careful, Ernest. Of what? I don't know. Didn't you tell me that the oligarchy will not die so easily? Of course not. This is just one of a number of blows. But the general strike has left them reeling. They never anticipated our power. This leads us to one of my favorite songs, a song that inspired Ernest, Avis, and all the revolutionaries of that time. Imagine yourself with them, singing along. In fact, if you want, you can sing along with the Warblies right now. For those of you who want to sing along, listen for the lines, When We Stand and Hand in Hand. We'll sing it first, and you'll sing it after. (laughs) That sounds perfect, Alana. I'll do it, too. And hunger be free Then come to your share Lend a hand There is power There is power In a band of working folk When they stand stand Hand in hand hand hand. That's a power That's a power That must rule in every land One industrial union grand Would you fight back Socialist Workers' Party We can change the world, you and me Yes, we can There is power, there is power In a band of working folk When they stand Stand Hand in hand hand. That's a power, that's a power That must rule in every land One industrial union grant Come, all ye workers from every land Come join in the grand industrial band Then we are share of this earth shall demand Come on to your share lend a hand Sing along. There is power, there is power in a band of working folk when they stand, when they stand hand, in hand, hand in hand That's a power, that's a power that must rule in every land Beautiful work on that song, everyone. And it looks like it's time for one more break. I would love to have a little more of that bread. It was delicious. I think the singers baked it themselves. Didn't you, Alana? (laughs) We did. It's good to have someone to share it with. So there's there's one more part to the story. Yes. Though I'm afraid it's the most harrowing part. We are coming to a very dark point in history. 
the emergence of the Iron Heel. It's delicious. Thank you. Delicious indeed. Until the next recording, thank you for listening to the Iron Heel, part of the Reenactment Archive. Join us again soon. That ends episode two. Thank you for listening. I'd like to share with you now an excerpt from my interview with Deborah Schaefer. The full interview will be released separately at a later date. Please remember to leave a review and rating if you enjoyed this episode. Hello, I'm Edward Einhorn, the writer and director of this adaptation of The Iron Heel, and I will be talking with Deborah Schaefer about her film The Wobblies, her documentary about the industrial workers of the world, which originally premiered at the New York Film Festival in 1979 and is now having a digital remake. Deborah is an Academy Award winning filmmaker who began making social issue documentaries as a member of the Newsreel Collective in the 70s. She co-founded Pandora Films, one of the first women's film companies, which produced several shorts. After The Wobblies, she focused on human rights in Central America and Latin America, directing many films, including Witness to War, Dr. Charlie Clements, which won the Academy Award for Short Documentary in 1985, and Fire from the Mountain, and Dance of Hope, which both played at the Sundance Film Festival. She directed one of the first post September 11th films, From the Ashes, 10 Artists, followed by From the Ashes Epilogue, which premiered at the Sundance and Tribeca Film Festivals. She is the executive producer of the Academy Award nominated short Asylum and has directed numerous acclaimed public television programs on women and the art. She directed and produced To Be Heard, which won awards at numerous festivals and aired nationwide at PBS. She has also been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and the Irene Diamond Lifetime Achievement Award by the Human Rights Watch Film Festival. Let's start off just by defining the Wobblies for those of our listeners who who have not heard of them before. The Wobblies was the nickname given to uh, members of an organization called the Industrial Workers of the World, which was founded in the United States in 1905. And nobody's really sure of the origin of actually the term Wobblies. There are many kind of joking explanations for the name. Somebody said, oh, a Chinese guy couldn't pronounce I-W-W, and he called it I-Wobble-Wobble, and that's where the Wobblies came from, and there are other sort of silly things like that. But they were the industrial workers of the world, and they were founded as an industrial labor union, really in opposition to the AFL, which was strictly a craft union at the time, and it was the idea was to organize all unskilled labor in the world into one giant union all over the world. The film, The Wobblies, really pretty much focuses on the Wobblies in the United States. And uh, could you tell me a little bit of, about the process of making The Wobblies? How, how did you first decide to make it? Well, I, I was just thinking the other day about how the film came about. And actually, the very first thing that influenced me was sometime in probably around 1970, somebody told me about a book, a very powerful picture book called Milltown, written by a guy named Bill Kahn. And the book was written in the 50s and is a picture book about the strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912, which was one of the first giant strikes that the Wobblies helped organize and helped win. And this was a book that was published in 1954 and was probably banned for being communist propaganda. And in the 70s, when I learned that, I was shocked that in the United States, a book had been banned. And then the other thing that shocked me was I had gone through high school in the United States. I'd gone to a very good, prestigious Eastern women's college. I had studied history and I had never heard of the IWW. I'd never heard of the industrial workers of the world. And I thought, well, this needs some looking into. (laughs) How come I've never heard of these people? So somebody I knew, a, a guy named Stuart Bird, who became my partner on the film, I had known from a film organization, we both belonged to a left-wing kind of documentary filmmaking group called Newsreel, and he wrote a play called The U.S. versus William D. Haywood. And I went to see his play one night, and it was produced, it was put on in a a theater in Manhattan. And a lot of, uh, a few former members of the IWW were in the audience, and they were, were very old. I mean, this organization was, its heyday was 1905 to about 1919, 1920. So even in 1977, we were talking about elderly people. And I thought, 
it just occurred to me that night. I said, somebody's got to do, somebody's got to record these people before they're gone. We have to do a film about them. And I approached Stu, who I hadn't worked directly with, but we knew each other. I said, Stu, let's do a film about the IWW. And he said, sure. And we started pretty much right away. We went and and we started, uh, we did our first interview, I think with somebody who had been at the play that night, a woman named Sophie Cohen, who at the time lived in Liberty, New York. And she had worked in the mills in Patterson, New Jersey. Yeah, we were not sure when we started the film how many surviving members of the IWW we would be able to find. We were really concerned about that. And so we started right away just putting the word out. There were a few people had contacted Stu Bird because they'd seen his film, uh, his play, sorry, and we were able to interview them. And we just, we kind of started, this is in the days before the internet. We didn't have uh, any way to put the word out you know, on, there was no Facebook or anything like that. So we did things, for instance, we were looking for a black worker in, from the port in Philadelphia. We created a leaflet that we handed out on the docks in Philadelphia, physically in person saying, do you know anybody who was a member of the IWW? We asked at senior citizen centers, we asked in churches And finally, somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody at a church introduced us to James Fair, who's the black longshoreman who is interviewed in the film. That was one of our more extreme searches. But we just, we put things like the equivalent of personal ads in the Nation magazine, in other newspapers around the country in different areas, because we knew that the Wobblies had been active all over the U.S. and that we were going to cover the textile mills in the East the migratory workers in the Midwest, the lumberjacks in the West, the miners in the West. We knew we had to have a big geographic reach for the film. So we just, we put notices all over the place. And eventually people started coming to us too. Somebody read our notice somewhere and called and said, you know, my grandfather was in the IWW. That's Sam Krieger who appears in the film. I mean, in the end, we found more than we could actually use, but we weren't sure how many we would find. And I'm sure they've all, I have not been actually in touch with every single one, but I'm pretty certain that everybody by now would. We filmed those interviews in 1978. So they've got to all be gone. It's it's an amazing archive. So we were chatting before when we performed the Iron Heel Live. So many of our audience members were longtime socialists or uh, labor union members who started singing along with the actors. And we, ended up creating a songbook for the show that people could open up and sing with us. And it was probably my favorite part of the live show. And I know that music is also an integral part of your movie. And you had mentioned that it began when somebody started spontaneously singing during an interview. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that very first interview that I mentioned before, Sophie Cohen. So the very first interview we filmed was with Sophie Cohen, who had worked in the Patterson Mills. And she spontaneously burst into song during the interview. And it's in the film. And it was such a wonderful moment that we then started asking people as we were interviewing them, we said, what song do you remember? Can you sing a song? And, and music was, singing was a major organizing tactic of the IWW. They had what they called the Little Red Songbook. I actually have a copy of it in my hand. It's this tiny little pamphlet-sized skinny book with a red cover that they, when they signed somebody up and gave them a, a membership card in the IWW, they also got a copy of the songbook. And the songs were mostly based on popular songs of the day, tunes that people knew, folk songs, religious songs, hymns, but with words that were rewritten by somebody in the IWW to be more in line with, you know, their principles in their organizing platform. So like one of their famous songs, which is in the film, is called The Preacher and the Slave. And it's uh, it's a song that makes fun of the Salvation Army because the IWW was always competing with the Salvation Army for the soapbox on the corner. So like it starts with the lyric, long haired preachers come out every night, try to tell you what's wrong and what's right. And when they get all your coin on the drum, they'll tell you when you're on the bum, you know, you will eat by and by in that glorious land above the sky. So it's all, uh, the songs were very satirical, very funny, and very important for morale building, for 
One of the favorites that people sang a lot was Hold the Fort for We Are Coming, Union Men Be Strong, Solidarity Forever. They had a version of the International with their own ending. Rebel Girl about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is a beautiful song. And I'm sure people have heard of Joe Hill because Joan Baez immortalized him in her song, I Dreamed I Saw Joe Hill Last Night. Joe Hill was a famous member of the IWW, and he wrote many of the songs. Well, thank you so much. Uh, And thank thank you for being part of this and and, uh, giving us your time. This episode was produced by Untitled Theatre Company No. 61, A Theatre of Ideas. It's adapted from Jack London's 1908 book, The Iron Heel. It starred Mike Iverson Jr. as Ernest Everhard, Yvonne Rowan as Antonia Meredith, Victoria Rule as Avis Everhard, Travis D. as Mr. Wixon, Nick Anderson as Bishop Morehouse, Joshua Wolf Coleman as John Cunningham, Gael Haskell as Alana, Ian W. Hill as Socialist 1, Maxwell Zener as Socialist 2, and Yvonne Cullinan as Socialist 3. The Warbleeds are Craig Anderson, John Bronston, Yael Haskell, and Jenny Lee Mitchell. Our songs in today's episode were Solidarity Forever, words by Ralph Chaplin to a traditional Protestant camp song of unknown authorship. Power in a Union, words and music by Joe Hill with additional lyrics by Edward Einhorn. And Which Side Are You On, original lyrics by Florence Reese, new lyrics by Edward Einhorn to a traditional Baptist tune of unknown authorship. Arrangements for the stage version of The Iron Heel were written by Chris Chappell. Arrangements for the audio play were written by Richard Philbin, who also provided all the instrumentals. Richard also composed and played our background music. The episode was sound designed and edited by Ian W. Hill. Sound effects are courtesy of the BBC through a Creative Commons license, or license from Storyblocks. The play was originally presented as a live stage version across various venues in New York, including Judson Church, Freedom Hall, and South Oxford Space in the summer of 2016. The play is published by Theatre 61 Press at theatre61press.com. Funding for this podcast was made possible in part by grants from the Lower Manhattan Community Council, the Puffin Foundation, and the Shapiro Fund. This podcast was recorded under a SAG after collective bargaining agreement. Please visit our website, untiledtheater.com, to learn more about the show and our theater company. You can also donate by texting Iron Heel with no spaces to 44321 and following the link. If you enjoyed this audio drama, please listen to our other audio drama series, The Resistible Rise of J.R. Brinkley. My name is Edward Einhorn, and I am the writer and director. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you can join us for the next episode. And that's this week's show. Please check out The Iron Heel through our show notes at sonicsociety.org. We are a proud partner of the Mutual Audio Network. You can join us on Twitter at Sonic Society or David Alt. Uh, no prize for guessing who that is. On Facebook at Audio Drama Radio Drama Lovers or the Sonic Society Group or wherever amazing audio drama can be found. Until next week, when we complete this dystopian epic, I'm Jack Ward. And I'm David Alt. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next Sunday. See you then. Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. I'm Jack Ward, and along with my co-host David Out. David Out. (laughs) The following message is for podcasters only. If you are a listener and not a podcaster, you are permitted to cover your ears and say la 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 for the next 30 seconds or so. Okay. Podcasters, if you create audio drama and or comedy, you are invited to join the brand new Mutual Audio Network. Not only will your productions be showcased in a brand new Netflix-ish type of distribution, but you'll also share in resources from music to sound effects to voices. 
To people saying la 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 la. For details, visit MutualAudioNetwork.com or inquire at MutualAudio at gmail.com. You can stop la-laing now. I can't hear you. Got my ears covered. La-la!